Rogers both believed that self-actualization was pretty rare and only about 2% of us can be regular self-actualizers. The most of us are just caught up in the day-to-day -day of work and chores and daily life hassles. So what can we do about it? Well, another area of positive psychology, not so much focusing on self-actualization, but more so focusing on the day-to-day -day grunt work of our lives, has said maybe we're not ready to become self-actualizers, maybe we can't just meditate towards nirvana all the time, but perhaps we can work on some concrete skills. Perhaps we can kind of do some of the labor that could get us ready to self-actualize. And so a big area of positive psychology is the area looking at things like resilience, grit, perseverance, and growth mindset. And those four terms can be used somewhat interchangeably, but it's the idea that you will adapt and you will overcome and you will keep trying, that you're not going to give up even if you face roadblocks. That's a skill we can see very early on in infancy. Some of us are born with higher ability in this, but it's the idea that perhaps we can learn. It's not the talent that matters, it's the effort. Now, in my own personal research, what I've been looking at the last five years or so has been looking at social emotional strengths in undergrad university students. And what my lab has discovered is that there's really a cluster of six skills which tends to predict how well university students are going to adjust to the stress of university. And, and so those six skills are illustrated here, but they're really calmness, the ability to self-regulate your emotions and calm down. Awareness, just to be aware of your own stress level and aware of the emotions you're feeling. Optimism, the ability to still have a more positive appraisal and positive outlook. Compassion and empathy, the idea that you're not getting hunkered down in your own and worried about your own issues, that you're still willing to reach out to others. Humility, the idea that you're able to accept your flaws and accept your strengths and you don't have too much pride or shame about either. And integrity, the idea that you'll do the right thing and you prepare for the future. And so those are the six attributes. We're still working on our studies. It's not yet published, but we have about five years of data on these six variables. So looking forward to sharing that with people eventually someday. And so this is a huge area of positive psychology where we focus on these strengths. Now you might notice one of these areas was awareness, being aware of your emotions. And that really ties in nicely to our last area in this unit. And that is the unit of mindfulness. Mindfulness is a major area in psychology now, though I still remember when it wasn't, but now we know being mindful is very important to our mental well-being and to our health. And mindfulness is really the idea of living in the present moment. We know from learning in all the other areas of psychology that we try to multitask. We aren't good at multitasking. In fact, we just uh, switch back and forth lots of tasks, but we try to keep a lot of stuff on our radar and in our pre-consciousness and we're constantly bombarding our consciousness with different ideas. And although we can do this, mindfulness is the argument that we shouldn't do this. That when you're to dinner with someone, focusing on what you're doing at dinner and the conversation and the mood and the ambiance and everything in your present moment is what's beneficial. You shouldn't be thinking about your tasks and how you're getting home that night and if your cell phone just rang and other things you gotta do the next work day. You should be focusing on the moment. And having too many screens or too many tabs open does slow down your computer and when we do it in our own brain, it slows us down and adds a lot more wear and tear. And so mindfulness is the idea that your mind isn't full of, of clutter of things. You're being mindful of the present moment. You're living in the moment. This is the idea that when you sit down to do schoolwork, you're doing schoolwork. You're not thinking about all the stuff you have to do tomorrow or thinking about how much you want to go to bed. And when you go to bed at night, you're thinking about, oh, I'm in bed and this is relaxing. You're not thinking about all the schoolwork you have to do. You focus on one thing at a time. We actually find this makes us much more efficient at things. And if you are worried and you procrastinate about lots of things, just picking one little task and doing that one little task can mean a big difference. So mindfulness is being aware of what we're on our mind and accepting what's happening in the present moment. This is something we struggle with, even if we know the basics of it, but there's lots of different ways we can practice mindfulness. Some of the very basic ones are the breathing meditation. And this is the idea you try to concentrate on inhaling and exhaling and not focus on anything else but your breath. And there's lots of apps and lots of techniques you can do to practice that. For those of us that have a hard time with breath meditation, there's lots of alternatives. Ideas that as long as you're doing something where you only have one thing on your mind, something like exercise could work. 
going for a walk where you just think left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, or going for a run or working on an elliptical or doing something where you have to focus and count your repetitions. Any type of exercise that your mind is only on the exercise counts as a mindful meditation. Then we have things like a body scan. What is a body scan? Well, one version of a body scan is when you focus on your toes and you focus on curling your toes up as tight as you can and counting to 30 and then relaxing your toes. And then you cramp up your foot muscles as tight as you can and count to 30. And then you relax your toes, then you relax, and then you relax your foot muscles. And then you cramp up your calves for 30 seconds. And then you cramp up your thighs, and then you do your buttocks and your lower abdomen, your upper abdomen, you do your chest muscles, your biceps, your triceps, your forearms, you clench up your hands, then you clench up your shoulders, and then you clench your neck, you even clench your jaw, you close your eyes, you wiggle your ears, you tighten your, your brow, your forehead, and every little group in your body, you tighten and then relax. And what you try to do is only focus on that one body group at a time. And it takes you a couple minutes to get through it. It was 30 seconds of each one. And it's the idea at the end of it, hopefully you're more relaxed than where you started. By tightening something for 30 seconds and then relaxing it, it tends to be more relaxed than it was before you originally tightened it. So this can help us to relax, but it also helps us to be mindful of just that. And it quiets all the other echoes in our brain. If none of these suggestions so far really ring home, perhaps music could work. Music is something that we often have to pay attention to the beats and the timing and the different compositions. And so maybe you're listening to music or perhaps you're playing music and trying to learn an instrument. Something that requires your full concentration can actually be beneficial. The ultimate goal here, of course, is to quiet the brain. We often value this brain that can multifunction, this brain that can think about many things at once. And in the workplace, being able to multitask is usually something that we consider beneficial. But in the long term or the course of our life, what we find is actually the skill of being able to quiet your brain is something that's much harder to obtain. And it's something that requires work. Sitting down and trying to meditate and not being able to quiet your brain is not a failure to meditate. As long as you were still trying, you were still strengthening that muscle. And so no matter what type of way you choose, it can still help you. And the final one I want to suggest, and I hope was kind of behind the scenes and implicit in this whole unit, was nature. We know that through environmental psychology, which we're going to talk about in the next unit, that being in nature can lower our stress levels. And that includes whether you're walking through a green space or whether you're watching fish in a tank or whether you're just watching a nature film. Being in nature can dramatically lower our cortisol level. It can make us feel more in the moment and it can help us in terms of our health. You have now reached the end of unit 13 health psychology. Well done. I hope you really enjoyed it.